Hey everyone, and welcome to my talk about video rendering on the front end and in the back end. Um, before I begin, just making sure, does anyone have a problem with me speaking in English? No, excellent. Great, so before I go into the actual application I'm talking about, let's start with Lightrix, the company I work at. Lightrix is a company that specializes in video and photo editing software for mobile. We have, by today, over 12 apps on both the iOS and the Android App Store. We've, established, <coughs> we've been established at 2000, 2013. At 2018, we became a unicorn. We have a couple of hundreds of employees, both in Jerusalem, Haifa, and in, uh, in our London offices. And the key thing that I want you to learn from this slide, well, first of all, obviously, we are awesome. Give us your CVs. But more importantly, that we're a well-established company with a lot of experience in photo and video editing in mobile. And the story that I'm going to tell in this, um, <clears throat> in this talk is the story of our first web-based application, the assumption we came into uh, its development with what we knew from the mobile area and the things we learned, the things we changed, and how we adjusted when we adjusted to web-based work. Now, before I continue, uh, just a couple of two, th two things about myself, personal things. First of all, I really, really love questions. I love them because when people ask me questions, I know what wasn't clear, and I can clarify that. And usually, when anyone has a question, that means that someone else in the audience also has a question. So please, when you want to, just raise your hand and ask a question. The second thing is that I'm easily distracted. So when you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for me to ask you to ask that question. Because if you'll just ask the question immediately, I'll be distracted and go off course. That being said, since the talk is recorded, if you see me answering a question before I repeat the question back so the people at home watching later will actually hear it, remind me to repeat the question so everyone in the future will also be able to understand what I'm talking about. So let's begin with the application, Boosted Web. And the video hopefully works. I'm not sure what this is. OK. <laughs> Part of the tef technical difficulties. I won't show you the application. I'll tell you about it. Boosted Web is, as I said, a video editing uh, application based on a browser. That means you open a browser tab, you log in, you upload a video, and then you start editing it. And the application allows you to add to modify text. Uh, the sound cuts off intermediately. I hope it's OK. Um, add text, modify text, add vi uh, visual effects, and control them. Then the user plays the video, sees whether they like it or not. And they once they are finished editing it, um, they export it. They get a video file. Boosted specifically is aimed at make easy making for uh, online advertisements, so most of our videos are 15 to 30 min uh, seconds long. Um, very short and very templated video editing, which sadly I can't show you at the moment. Now, it isn't the first video editing uh, application we've created, so we've had a general idea of how does it look from the technical side. The basic play loop we have is we have a video file, which for those who don't know is composed of a series of images compressed so that it will be, it will take a reasonable size in, uh, on your disk. So for every frame, every image in the video and every image we want to show, we decode a frame from the video file. That is, decompress the, fl uh, the, uh, the current image so we can get the image. Then we create a rendering model by interpolating values. If, for example, we want to move text across the screen, we need on every frame to know what is the location of that text. So for every frame, we modify all of our models to know what is their co 
current values, then given an input frame and a series of rendering models, we render that frame, and then we display the resulting frame to the user. That's the first play loop, where the user edits the video, plays it, and re-edits until they're happy with the result. And then when they want to export the video, they do the same loop for every frame in the video. They decode a frame, interpolate values, render a frame, and then instead of displaying each frame, they encode these frames into a new video file, which means, again, creating a series of images and compressing them. Um, I will talk about the majority of these steps in this talk. The one step that I won't talk about is the interpolation step. I will compress that and just assume it is part of the render frame step in all the following slides. If you're interested in that, because there's a lot of technical depth in that too, there's another talk I gave linked to at the last uh, slide. So we have the basic play loop. We've done that in multiple apps in the past. Can we do that in web native languages using web native technologies? And that's an important question because while it might cost us a talk at a CPP convention, using web native technologies means that all of our front end uh, engineers can work on every part of the application. They can work not only on the user experience and user interface, but also on the rendering engine and on the decoding and encoding engine. So we asked ourselves initially, is this play loop at all possible when using only the browser? So in order to decode a video, we know that we can decode a video in the browser because, well, we've been on YouTube. We saw videos play. There's a specific HTML object called an HTML video element, which allows us to give it uh, um, a video file, and it will decode and play it. Can we interpolate values? Yes, that's just pure mathematics. If we can run code, we can do that. Can we render a video? Can we render visual effects? Yes, there's the WebGL, Web Graphics Library, which gives us practically all the abilities that we have in desktop-based or mobile-based graphics libraries. So we can do that. Can we encode the result to a video file? Well, encoding, just like decoding, is something which happens very quickly when you can be, when you're hardware-assisted, when you have drivers which are connected directly to the hardware. Sadly, that's not something that the browser is very eager to, get, to give users. So we can't do that fast, but we can have a software codec. We can just import the relevant libraries and in the browser, in our code, encode everything. Initially, we thought, hey, we can do that. Reality just in the face pretty fast. What happened? Usually, when you write code, when you write very performant code, the first round isn't fast enough it doesn't really work in the latency, in the speed you require, but you write it first just to see that everything works. So on our first batch of, uh, on the first round of code that we have wrote, everything worked okay. We could render frame, we could play video, but once we had a lot of effects accumulating one over the other, we've noticed that as happens, each frame that we rendered took more time to render to actually compute the effect that we wanted than it takes to play the video. So the video became choppy. This is natural, nothing to worry about. Usually the initial code you write is suboptimal. But then we've noticed something weird. The video became choppy, but it also became out of sync. Our rendering code was rendering in one rate, but the video, the video played by the HTML video element, played in its own rate, in real time. And the fact that the code lagged behind it didn't stop the HTML video element. And that's where we learned a very important thing about reading the specs. Essentially, we've learned that an HTML video element can't give us a lot of information and a lot of control. It is meant to, give a, to let us play videos in real time. 
So it doesn't tell us things about the videos which are relevant for playing the video in real time. For example, what is the actual frame rate of the video? How many frames there are in each second of video? Because that's something the HTML video element needs to know, not us. It can't seek to a specific frame. You can tell it, start playing from second X. But if you're going into a subframe, uh, uh, if you're aiming at a specific frame, not at a specific time, you want to be sure that you're playing each and every frame, you can't do that. You can't do that because you don't know the frame rate, and you can't do that because the HTML video element, again, is aimed at giving you the experience you should have when playing video, not when you have to access each and every frame. It is, as I said, geared toward real-time playing. This means, as was my first example, that when it experiences a heavy workload, it will just skip frames. If it says, I'm playing a video, and the last operation took half a second of CPU before I got another rendering opportunity, I will play the frame which comes after half a second. Now, we knew that when we'll optimize our rendering code, that will be OK. Playing in real time for the user should be OK. But encoding using a software codec is going to be slow. And when we play in real time, if we're working on a weak mach machine, well, the user might expect that the video will skip a frame here or there. But when we encode a video, we cannot skip a frame. We have to give the user a, fr uh, a video which, when played, regardless of where it's played, will play smoothly. So skipping frames is something you can do when you play. It isn't something you can do when you encode. But we can work around that, right? We can estimate when frames change. We can just continually play and seek and play and seek and work around it. And we've tried that. And we have saw that other people have done that. And it works. But it works against the intended usage. That was a lot of code, which was very complex and essentially went around the way that you're supposed to use an HTML video element in order to get the effect that we wanted, which an HTML video element wasn't supposed to give. And more importantly ab about that, it worked where we tested it. Now, the thing about browser-based uh, <coughs> objects is that each browser will implement them and might implement them differently. So while you have a single spec which defines how the object should behave versus its API calls, the internal behavior of it is completely browser specific. So a solution which assumes that in order to do A, the uh, video element behind the scenes will do A, B, and C, will, might work on Chrome, but it might not work on Safari or in Firefox or on any other browser which implements the video element differently. This means that we have to work to write a lot of very complex logic and continually test it on every browser and every browser version in order to verify that it works OK. We didn't like that. We don't like that. OK, there's another solution. We can, instead of relying on the HTML video element, use a software codec in order to decode the video, too, just like we've done with the encoding, right? Encoding writing to a file, decoding reading from a video file. We can read the video file in Codec 2. Um, we can, for example, use the FFmpeg library, which gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot of available codecs in order to read a lot of different video formats. Uh, and, and gives us a single API in order to read all of them. But that's a C library. So in order to use it in a browser in, a browser in JavaScript, we need to either run it on a server and then continually send each frame from the server to the browser. That's quite a bit of network traffic. Or we can compile it to something which can interact with JavaScript and 
serve it as a single huge chunk at the time we tested it to be a couple of tens of megas to the user whenever the application loads. Either one of these options is a very good option because network traffic is important and loading fast is very important in order to give the user a smooth user experience. Um, both of them will be slow either when we encode or when we load, and it just wasn't a good enough user experience to justify it. Okay, so we need to have one flow of playing the video and one flow of encoding the video that just run them separately. Playing has to be done in the browser, has to be done in real time, but it is okay if we occasionally skip a frame here or there. So let's play in the browser using an HTML video element. Decode a frame, render a, a frame, display a frame, when it skips, it skips. When it's smooth, it's smooth. Everything is OK. When we encode, we'll just send a request to the server. In the server, we'll decode each and every frame, no matter how much time it takes. Again, we'll render a frame, and then we'll encode the resulting frame to a video element. Everything is OK, except for the fact that this diagram is very cute and very simplified. but this middle part, this duplication, isn't that great at all. Rendering code is complex. Rendering code isn't very fun to write. And rendering code can contain a lot of very easy to make mistakes. You don't want to write rendering code twice. More importantly, you don't want to write rendering code twice and not be sure that you get exactly the same result in both cases. Because if the user edits a video, views the video, and says, I'm happy with this result, when the user will export the video, they expect to see exactly the same thing in the file that they receive. And if we have this very complex code, which is finicky and might even be machine dependent, and we write it twice, the chances are that in one case and in the other case, somewhere along the way, some behavior will diverge and we'll start seeing effects which look differently in the browser from the server. We don't want that. That just means that we gave the user a very bad user experience. Think about that. The user needs to edit the video, view it in the browser, export it, view the exported file, verify wh whether the exported file looks the way it uh, uh, they want them to. And if it doesn't, they need to start guessing what happened in the browser. What's the difference between the browser implementation and the server implementation in order to get the result they want? And since the vast majority of our users aren't an expert in using graphics library, we don't expect them to make that kind of diffing which tries to reverse engineer our engineering mistakes. This isn't good enough. Why isn't, good, uh, isn't it good enough? Let's see how the stacks diverge and where this complexity starts from. First of all, different, the basic difference between writing code for the server and writing code for the browser is the language. One is JavaScript, the other is C++. You can find two languages which are more different than JavaScript and C++, but you'll have to work in order to do that. These are very different languages with very different idioms and structures. We have different decoding interfaces. And it doesn't stop there, because when we render, we're using different rendering libraries. We have OpenGL on the, on the server, an open source graphic library. And we have WebGL in the browser, which is a web-based browser-implemented graphic library. Now, both of these libraries are designed, uh, OpenGL was created originally, I think, somewhere in the 90s. WebGL is a later edition. And they're designed in order to be very similar. They have the same idioms. They contain the same objects, but they have very different structure. 
OpenGL is a C library. <laughs> you use it by calling global functions which modify some kind of global state which is managed by your graphics driver. WebGL is designed to be object-oriented, to have an, uh, <laughs> interfaces and APIs which are more similar to the interfaces and ABI, APIs that the average web developer is used to. So while behind the scenes you'd expect WebGL to just translate more or less to OpenGL calls, on the surface, on the API side, they are different enough that your functions will look different and, again, might contain mistakes or behaviors which different, differ. So our stacks continue to differ. And it doesn't stop there. We want to play around with text. We want to shape it diff in different ways. We have to find one library which works in JavaScript, another one which works in C++. Any additional uh, ability we want to use, we have to find something that does it in both areas, and we have to make sure that the behavior is as similar as possible, even though, again, just like with WebGL and OpenGL, the interfaces are probably different, the idioms are different, etc. This is something we want to avoid. Enter WebAssembly. What is WebAssembly? WebAssembly, or WASM for short, is a language or a standard that allows for secure and yet performant cross-platform computing. It is originally intended to be the assembly level language of the web. It gives the performance of writing a very, very low level language while still having the basic security requirements of browsers. It is essentially something, it is equivalent to a JVM bytecode or CLR bytecode, which is com compiled from every language or every language which someone has created a compiler from, but it is compilable from most languages, and it can run in a lot of runtimes, desktop-based, mobile-based, and important for our case, browser-based runtimes. It can run in a runtime inside a sandbox and be secure on the one side, performant on the other side, and most importantly for us, we can write C++ code, compile it to WebAssembly, and then write that code in the browser. Again, for a more in-depth analysis of WebAssembly and how it came to be, links in the last slide. So we need a compiler in order to take our C++ code and com convert it to WebAssembly. And we have chosen mscripten, which does a bit more than just compiling code. Its first ability is, yes, we take code in C or C++ and compile it to WebAssembly. Um, using the LLVL, uh, LLVM system, uh, LLVM has a WebAssembly backend, but it does a bit more. First of all, it allows you to create JavaScript binding for C++ objects. That means that if you're using C++ in an object-oriented or way, it allows you not only to expose global functions to JavaScript, it also allows you to expose actual objects to JavaScript and continue working in an object-oriented way across the WebAssembly boundary. It also supplies abstractions in the other way. When we work in C++, we're used to having things like a file system, which aren't available in WebAssembly. WebAssembly makes no assumption about where it runs, and so it makes no assumption about the existence of such a thing as a file system. Mscripten allows us to access files by creating an API available from JavaScript, which allows us to write files into a memory buffer, which serves as uh, a virtual file system. And so we can create files in JavaScript and access them in WebAssembly, which again, uh, again may, may allows us to use the same idioms in the server and in the browser. In the server, when we want to read a video or we want to read a font file for some text, we read it from 
the server's file system. In WebAssembly, in the browser, we have a virtual file system. We copy there all the files we need. And again, we have the same idioms, the same code written once. And more specific to our case, it also compiles OpenGL code to WebGL. Whenever it sees a call to OpenGL behind the screen, uh, the scenes, it converts it to WebAssembly code, which calls JavaScript code, which calls the Web, uh, WebGL API, which means we can write code in OpenGL and have it executed on WebGL in the browser. What does this mean in order to, uh, <coughs> for the cause of simplifying our work? means that our stacks are now unified. We write the majority of our code in C++ only once and have it run at the same way using the same libraries, at least using the same calls to the libraries, both in the browser and in the server. We still can't avoid all the differences. We still have different decoding interfaces, for example, but we have reduced the amount of redundancy in our system significantly by using WebAssembly. Life is good, and we're happy. But are we entirely happy before that? Yes, a question. How about performance? Um, I, I'm sorry, can you? How about performance? When you are using the WebGL instead of Oh, OK. So the question uh, was, is it still performant enough? And the answer is very clearly yes. First of all, if we would have uh, written the code originally in the browser just in JavaScript, it might as well has been, uh, have been slower than the equivalent code in WebAssembly because WebAssembly is designed ahead of time to be performant while JavaScript is very performant today. Again, talks on the last slide, but it isn't as performant as WebAssembly. And in regards to WebGL versus OpenGL, the answer is yes, WebGL might be slightly slower than OpenGL, but it is the most performant way we have to render video. So whatever, other, whatever we want to do, this is our best option. Um, we wouldn't have any other way of doing that. If th there are some devices alas, that our code is still too, uh, too, too, too hard for them to run. We've benchmarked, and essentially we saw that on most laptops, our benchmark was laptops without a discrete GPU and disconnected from power because, as we know, when a laptop is not connected to, to power, usually the CPU might scale down its operations. And the vast majority of, uh, of laptops we tested this on from the last, let's say, the equivalent to the last four or five years have managed to play simple videos with simple effects at 60 frames per second and harder videos with more complex effects at 30 frames per second. Uh, but that was obviously after a lot of optimization on our side. Uh, but again, whether it was fast enough or not, this was the best option we had, the, at least until uh, WebGPU will be widely available. We don't have anything faster than that. Uh, you had a continuing question? Okay, OpenCV is compiled to WebAssembly. Um, it, while OpenCV, when run natively, might use hardware acceleration and things like SIMD, et cetera, you need to check your, uh, your compilation of OpenCV to see, but it's very likely to not be hardware accelerated. But regardless of this talk, there's a very interesting uh, demo, one of the earlier WebAssembly demos, which has demonstrated facial recognition in real time in the browser using OpenCV. So I'd hazard and say that maybe not 30 frames per second. I don't know what exactly you're doing in OpenCV, but uh, it should be good enough. Um, 
but it's probably not hardware accelerated, so I think WebGL might be a better way to go. Yes? SSC optimizations are on by default today in MScripten? Excellent. So, so we hear from the crowd, if you're using the latest versions of Mscripten, you should have SSC and SIMD available by default. I'm not sure whether it works on all the browsers, but again, check it. Best way to benchmark something is to compile it, run it. Um, OK, so we managed to use WebAssembly. We managed to combine our code. Let's see how it's, how our code is structured now. We have the browser. We decode using a video element. We render a frame using OpenGL code, which calls WebGL behind the scenes, and we display it. Whenever the user wants to export the video, they, server, they send a request to a server. The server decodes each frame using FFmpeg, renders a frame using the same OpenGL C++ code, and then encodes the result to the video element. We've significantly reduced the complexity of our code. Are we happy yet? Not exactly. These two arrows seem, again, very simple, but in reality, they contain a lot of very meaningful differences. And where is that difference? Again, story time. I've told you that initially we wrote the code in JavaScript, started running it, things were slow. OK, let's optimize the, web, uh, the rendering code, make it run fast. Everything was OK. At the same time, concurrently, we've started developing the C++ code in order to write our rendering code in the back end. Everything was running smoothly. Once we, comp uh, once we compiled everything to WebAssembly and started running it in the browser, we've entered a problem because in the past, after we decoded a frame using the video element, we loaded it into a WebGL texture using a built-in interface, which takes as an input parameter an HTML video element. We couldn't do that in our C++ code because C++ doesn't interface with HTML video element. They're something which is browser-based in JavaScript. Um, so. We read the API. We saw, OK, there's a function to copy the current frame data into a, an array. We'll just take that array, copy it to WebAssembly memory, and then copy it into an OpenGL texture. Everything is great. We can just move the memory around a bit, and life will be great, except for the fact that we took code which ran at 60 frames per second and upwards modified it a bit, and suddenly performance went down. It went really down. It didn't have to acceptable 30 frames per second. It didn't quarter to very bad or choppy 15 frames per second. It went down to four or five frames per second. That means that video doesn't even seem like it's playing. It just hops between different images. Why was that? In order to understand why was that, we need to understand a bit about the security requirement of WebAssembly. WebAssembly has its own memory buffer. It's called linear memory. And that's the only memory it can access. WebAssembly can be run by a lot of runtimes, but wherever it runs part of its security standard, it means that it is sandboxed. The runtime can copy things into WebAssembly's memory, but WebAssembly cannot read things which are outside of WebAssembly memory. So while we as low-level programmer know that somehow, somewhere, we might read memory from out of our thread or out of our process or maybe even access OS-restricted memory if we're not careful and the OS isn't careful, that should not be possible in WebAssembly. 
Because WebAssembly can only interact with the system in a very predefined way, it can only access memory in a very, and the memory it has, it is limited to what the system gives it. And this, the fact that it has its own memory and it cannot read out of it, means that everything you want to use in WebAssembly has to be copied into WebAssembly memory. And we know that copying sometimes is taking huge chunks of data and moving it, but sometimes it's just taking a pointer to huge chunks of data and moving it. We cannot copy a pointer because it will point to memory outside of the memory which is accessible to WebAssembly. If we want to copy frame data, we have to copy the whole frame into WebAssembly memory. <coughs> and what does it mean when we want to load a frame into a texture? Let's see the difference in experience. In WebGL, a JavaScript-based API, which <coughs> is aware of browser-based objects, such as the HTML video element, we have an API in order to fast load information from a frame into a texture. A texture, just like a frame is the image representation in a video, a texture is the image representation in a graphics library. In OpenGL, we have no concept of an HTML video element, so obviously we have no fast API in order to load things uh, into an OpenGL texture. In JavaScript, uh, as I told you before, WebGL is likely to, behind the, uh, the scenes, use OpenGL or Vulkan or Metal or whatever graphic library is used by the browser. It is very likely to use actual um, objects which are similar to OpenGL. But the API which is given to the coder, to the user, which is us, is an opaque JavaScript object. We cannot map it to a matching uh, graphics library or graphics driver object. In OpenGL, textures are represented, again, by identifiers, which point at some data, some managed state in the driver behind the, in the scenes. Again, the core object isn't available to us. So we, have, we might have a WebGL texture but we have no way of converting it to an OpenGL texture unless we've used mscripten, right? Because we know that mscripten behind the scenes can do that. But our problem is that we can't do that. So when we were, when initially we copied the information, we've taken three steps. We've taken the frame data from the HTML element, copied it, into an array, a JavaScript array. Taken that, uh, that array, copied it into WebAssembly, and then taken it from WebAssembly memory and copied it into OpenGL uh, texture, or in practice, a WebGL texture. These are three copies. We could have had just one, but it's more expensive than that because it's very likely, not promised, not part of the spec, but very likely, that the video element saves the frame data in GPU memory because GPUs work very well in decoding video and they need to display the frame. So it might as well be in the graphics and <coughs> available to the graphics driver. When we copied it throughout the whole system, we've taken it from GPU memory, copied it to CPU memory, copied it again to another portion of CPU memory, and then copied it to the, uh, to the graphics library, copying it again back to GPU memory. We could have had a single copy between uh, GPU and GPU memory, or maybe just having a pointer pointing to the original data. We don't know what happens behind the scene of the fast API. Instead, we've copied it across memory segments. That's very uh, expensive. It's no wonder that copying was so slow. So, what was our problem? We have the renderer code. We were very happy that we could write it in C++ and use 
and use a OpenGL and use it twice. We had pre-existing front-end code used WebGL in order to render the, in order to load things, and we couldn't make them interact. We couldn't efficiently pass data from the JavaScript front-end side and use it in textures in the WebAssembly. We could copy the data, but that was expensive, but we couldn't copy a WebGL texture because there is no equivalent representation in C++ for it. Let's phrase that a bit differently in order to understand the solution. We had data. It was available or representable in JavaScript, and we need some kind of representation for it available in WebAssembly, in C++. We didn't want to copy the data and create a new representation, but we had, since we had two different representations, we had an abstraction layer, an abstraction gap between one representation of the data and the representation that we could use, that we needed to use. We wanted the same memory chunks, the same memory area. We couldn't reuse the objects, which told us where in memory it is and how it can be used. That was our problem. Luckily, we can work that, that. When we phrase the problem like that, we can fix that. See, mscripten is open sourced. You can read the code. It is written mostly in Python, parts of it in JavaScript. It is very readable and completely available. So we knew ahead of time that mscripten uses WebGL in order to manage OpenGL calls. It makes sense. It's also, I think, an official part of their spec. We started reading, and we understood something pretty obvious. mscripten takes WebGL textures. Whenever it receives a call to create an OpenGL texture, it creates a WebGL texture and assigns to it an identifier in order to give it, an, in order to create the identifier necessary in order to use that texture in OpenGL. How it does that in practice has arrays of, um, of WebGL objects, frame buffers, textures, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm sorry, due to the, some imaging things, you, you can't see that these are arrays. And it, it keeps pointers to the WebGL objects, and it takes the indices in the array as identifiers, which it returns to OpenGL. Essentially, when we know that we have handle number one for a texture in OpenGL, it means that mscripten knows to map that texture to the texture in cell number one in the texture array. And it does that using the, I have no idea what happening, what's happening with the display right now, uh, using the get new ID function, which is a function that receives an object, a WebGL object, an array of WebGL objects, inserts that object into array, and returns the index of that object in the array. That way, mscripten creates OpenGL identifiers to WebGL uh, objects. Only problem, that function is an internal function. It is not part of the mscripten API. But in JavaScript, that's not really a, project, uh, a problem. Our solution was very simple. On the JavaScript side, we create WebGL textures. We create, we expose the get new ID function, uh, expose part of it, duplicate part of it. Um, but we now have a, a JavaScript function that allows us to access the state that mscripten manages and insert objects into it and receive identifiers which are usable in WebAssembly. And then using WebGL objects and JavaScript APIs, we have fast loading of data into these objects. And then in order to actually use these textures, it's just a matter of copying their identifiers, copying a single texture 
instead of the whole frames data. And the only downside of this is that now we need to explicitly remove, just like we've explicitly inserted each texture into the mscript in state, we also need to explicitly remove each texture from the mscript in state, otherwise mscript in will keep it alive forever. So adding more lifetime management to JavaScript is never fun, but that price was acceptable. Is the solution clear? Any questions? Excellent. So, all's well that ends well. We've implemented that. It was a very short hack on the front end side, and we went straight back to having easy 60 frames per second on most devices. Life is good. We wrote complex rendering logic, which does a whole lot of things that I'm not going to go into, and we wrote it once. We used it twice, wrote it once, we've significantly reduced the complexity of our workload. And the code that was needed in order to bridge the effort, at least on our side, was pretty minimal. I'm not going to say writing mscripted was, mscripten was minimal work, but what we needed to do in order to bridge the gap wasn't a lot of work. So life is good. Only question remaining is, is this a solution that I recommend to use? See, in general, relying on internal implementation isn't a smart thing to do. We don't know whether mscripten is going to change the way it uses textures, it maintains the interface between OpenGL and WebGL, and if they ever change it, no one will tell us. And by no one will tell us, I mean no one, not even a compiler, because all of that happens in JavaScript code. So whatever they change, the only way we'll find it once we upgrade an inscription in, 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 in version is to run the site and see that everything works OK on every browser possible, because again, implementations might vary. Relying on internal implementation, internal APIs, is not recommended. On the other hand, I hope that the way I shape the problem shows you that we didn't really have any alternative to use. We had, as long as we didn't want to write the code twice, we had to some way bridge the gap between the interfaces the front-end JavaScript code can use and the interfaces the engine C++ OpenGL code uses. We had to insert textures into mscripten, and that's just not an API they had, so we had to do that. And also, we've added more things to manage their lifetime in arrays which we don't really have direct access to and shouldn't have direct access to, so uh, not great. All in all, I give the solution a score of five missing emoji font, but those were shrug emojis, four shrug emojis out of five. Wow. For, uh, <laughs> yes. Oh yes, there's an entire talk just talking about how complex it is rendering emojis. Um, for those that wonder how complex it is, just look at how Windows decided not to render flag emojis because they don't want to go get into that. So yes, um, a talk about rendering where rendering doesn't work very well, joy. <laughs> Bottom line, life is great. We can write C++ code and use it really everywhere. We always said C++ is a cross-platform language. Now it is not only cross-platform across operating systems, it is also cross-platform across runtimes inside operating system. Excellent. We have tools that, allows us, that allow us to bridge the differences, not only, again, between operating systems, but within tools limiting themselves to sandboxes inside these operating system. 
we have tools, but they're not excellent. We, might, we still need to hack around. We still need to understand how they work in order to get every last ounce of performance, in order to get what we want. And also, whenever you render, everything is more complex. Different APIs, everything is hidden from you. Life is hard. But still, we get nice talks. There are, here are the links you want to. They'll be available in the show notes, and they will look better when display will work correctly. Thank you very much. As I said, Lightrix is awesome. Come work for us. And questions. Yes. Well, there is, in order to solve the original decoding issue, there's the web codec initiative, which gives us low level frame by frame decoding um, in order to really ha solve this exact problem. We've started looking into that, but until it won't work on every browser, at the moment it works on Chrome using only specific flags. Um, but until it will work on all browsers, it's just not a production level solution. Um, I assume we can ask Emscripten, or ask meaning open a PR to Emscripten in order to expose an API that will allow us to fast load using, uh, using such an alias OpenGL texture. We haven't done that um, in my experience PRs against them scripting are pretty slow. They're very nice, very uh, responsive discussion groups, but PRs haven't managed to move that quickly, so we had to hack around. I am not aware of any other solution in order to do that. There is also the WebGPU initiative, um, which should give us better life when rendering. Um, at the moment, as far as I know, there are only header files for WebGPU um, Implementation-wise, there is only the Rust WGPU library, which I'm aware of. There's also the Dawn library on Google, but I'm not sure. I haven't experimented with it enough in order to know, but I'm not sure whether using WebGPU will allow us to bridge this abstraction gap in any case. Um, but yes. Video codex and WebGPU are the future of rendering, and once they become standardized, we will be on them. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. And the, the so mm -hmm. it, it essentially means forming uh, No, no. Okay. I, I'll clarify. The question was whether in order to do this change we needed to fork Emscripten and use our own version. And the answer is no. This change only regarded accessing Emscripten's global JavaScript object. It had nothing to do with the way Emscripten compiles the code because the whole change was on the JavaScript side, giving the, uh, the front-end code an ability to load the textures fast. We could have done it also on the compiler side. It would have been more complex. Emscripten uses global arrays uh, in order to manage uh, I'm not sure if global or on the current context, not going into that, uh, but it uses arrays which are, for the sake of this discussion, global, and so could be accessed once we knew their name. So we didn't need to change anything in Scripten, we only had to change anything in the code, in our code. Yeah, well, well, I'm not sure if I, I actually, uh, mm -hmm. clarify the uh, I'm sorry, we just, and I need to say also that the next talk will be at 12.10, just like the schedule says. So the next break will be shortened. 
and uh, we'll speak face to face. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.